We're in a series called Miracles, and uh, today I want to talk about the miracle of kindness. And um, I'm excited about this message this morning because it, it uh, really just came to me this past week in a quiet time that I was having with the Lord, and I was, I was in the book of Acts. I'm, I'm reading, my Devo time right now is, is going through the book of Acts. So how I do my Devos is I pick a book, and, uh, and then uh, I read a chapter a day, um, but I spend a lot of time as I'm reading through that chapter, I, I think about what I'm reading, and I stop, and uh, you know, sometimes I'll underline you know, a verse, or I'll write something in the, the, the column, and, and I'll, I'll just sit, and I'll, I'll meditate on it. I'll think about it. That's, scripture says, meditate upon the Word day and night. Be careful to live according to what's in it. Psalms 1, it says, if you do that, you'll be like a tree firmly planted by the river's edge, and you will bear much fruit. It says your leaf will never wither. How many want to bear fruit? I, I want to bear fruit. And so it's the Word of God as we meditate upon that Word of God as we get it inside of us. And, and so nowhere in the Bible it says read it. Because when we read something, you read it like a newspaper or a magazine or, you know, you're reading it like you're reading your phone. But when you get into the Word, you think about it, you process, you meditate it because that is food for your spirit. It, 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 it builds you up. It strengthens you. It prepares you for everything that you need. So I want to read a significant story this morning, and then I'm going to bring some application, and uh, we're going to talk about some, some things that, that I believe every, every born-again believer, every spirit-filled believer should, should see that comes out of this story. So Acts chapter 3, picking up at verse 1. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. This is a pause moment for me when I, when I read a story like this. So the first thing I do is I get a visual of this guy being carried to the temple every day. He was, he was lame from birth. And we find out later in the story that he's actually over 40 years old. So for over 40 years, this guy's been carried to the temple where he sits and he begs. And I don't know. I wonder what that would be like. I wonder how he felt every day. Uh, did he have any hope? Did he, did he even know the healing power that could be in the name of Jesus? Did he understand any of those things? And so when I do this, and, and my encouragement to us is when we, when we start getting into the Word of God is, is wear it. Put it inside of you. Think about it. Put yourself into the story. Verse 3, it says, When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave, him, gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. So Peter looks at him and he goes, look at me, gets, gets eye contact. I used to do this with my kids when I was trying to, to get on the same page with my kids, when I was trying to make a point, when I was trying to help them see the importance of something or that we had a deal between us and, and I would say, look at me. Look at me in the eyes. And sometimes I, I would say, look at me in the eyes. And then when I would share whatever I'm sharing, I would say, do you understand? Do you, do you, do you hear what I'm saying? And they're like, yeah, dad, yeah, dad. No, let's shake on it. Look at me. Let's shake on it. You feel that? All of a sudden, it's, something's happening in that moment. And, and Peter looks at this guy and he says, look at me. And he's, he's expecting to get something. And then Peter says this in verse 6. He says, and Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. We just did that song. What do you need to put Jesus over? How do you need to apply Jesus to something in your life? This morning as we were singing that song and Carmel led us into just applying that word to whatever that situation was, I found myself doing that. 
And I thought, wow, I don't know if I've ever done it that way. Jesus, I bring you into, and whatever the thing is. Jesus, I bring you into the addiction. Jesus, I bring you into the anger. Jesus, I bring you into the insecurity of my life. Jesus, I bring you into the broken relationship. Jesus, I bring you into the hurt that I've experienced from someone else. Jesus, I bring you into my finances. I bring you into my fear. Jesus, I bring you into anything in my life because it's only in Jesus' name that it can be taken care of and dealt with. And so he says this. He says, I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have, I give you. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. I'm thinking right now for, for, for Peter and, and John in dealing with this, this man that Peter, when he said, I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And, and how did Peter show his faith? He reached out to grab the man's hand and to lift him up. Can you imagine walking down the street, there's a lame person sitting there. Maybe they're begging. I mean, in Los Angeles, you can go just about anywhere and there are people like that all over the place. Homeless. And they're asking for money and can you imagine just for a moment that in your life you would have that, that faith to turn around and say, hey, I don't have any money, but what I do have in the name of Jesus. And you reach out and you lift him up. Do you feel your heart beating a little bit right now? Extra? The sense of putting yourself into that kind of scenario can be very scary, can't it? It says in verse 8, he jumped to his feet and began to walk. <laughs> Peter, I, I don't know, it just hit me. You know, it says he reached out, he picked him up, and his, his feet straightened, and then he began to walk. He jumped up and he began to walk. Peter probably went, Phew, man, I'm glad it worked out like that. <laughs> Because, man, if it didn't work out, that, I would have looked kind of silly in that moment, right? I should have been a stand-up comedian. <laughs> it says, he, he jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So there's the picture. This guy's for 40 years, over 40 years has been lame. And he is healed by the name of Jesus. Peter and, and John are there. And all this is happening. And nobody can deny it because this man's been there for years and years and years. And everybody in that place probably knew him and of him. And probably a lot of them at one time or another had handed him some money or some food or whatever it may be. And now they see this guy walking around, jumping up and down, probably praising God and, and beside himself. And they all see it. And they're all amazed. It says that they're in wonderment. And then Peter... And John began to talk about Jesus. It's in the afternoon. It's later on now. And they begin to tell the people that this man is walking and is healed because of the risen Lord Jesus. Oh, by the way, the one that you crucified. That's what it says. This is the one that you sent to the cross who rose again and in the name of Jesus there is life, there is wholeness, there is healing. And because this miracle happened, now Peter and John, they have an audience. When we do Baptize California, there are going to be hundreds of people down on the beach getting baptized. Thousands. Thank you, Dan. I, I, I misspoke. Thousands of people. Probably right. And there are going to be people down there at Redondo Beach that are going to be hanging out at the pier, 
doing lunch or doing dinner, and, and they're going to see all of these people. And they're going to see a move of God because there's going to be a supernatural joy that is going to overcome that beach because Jesus Christ is going to be preached and the Holy Spirit is going to be moving and people are going to be drawn to that. And they're going to say, I don't know what they got, but I want that. Jesus, I want you as my Lord and Savior. Hey, can I get baptized too? That's, that's the significance. This is what, what the opportunity was for them. When we do this on Sunday morning, when we come together and we talk about Jesus, we worship Jesus, we engage with others, we we encourage one another, we pray with one another, we give each other a hug, a handshake, we meet somebody that we've never met before. All of these things are opportunities for us to glorify the name of Jesus. And so here's this guy, he gets radically healed, he jumps up, he's dancing around, and Peter and John are preaching the gospel now to these people, and then, of course, what happens? The religious people hear about it. You know, we have religious people today in the church. We have, we have people today that, that, that think they're all that in a bag of chips, because of the religious stronghold that is on them. When Jesus came into this world, he, he, he came in for relationship. He didn't come for religion. In fact, he came to set us free from the law of, of religion. And yet today, there are religious people in the church, Christians, that would speak negatively towards any kind of moment of seeing somebody get healed because they would say that that's not for today. They would probably look down upon a massive baptism taking place on a beach because their religion would cause them to think, well, do they really know the Lord? Have you done a teaching on it yet? Have you led them through the four spiritual laws? Do they understand what it means to be born again? You know, they would walk through that process pretty religiously. And oftentimes when that happens, what does it do? It pushes people away. Don't get me wrong. We we want sound doctrine. You know, we don't want to be we don't want to be fooling around, you know, and just speculating or having opinions about biblical things. We we want to know that we know, and we want to have assurance in that. And that's why the Holy Spirit's so important because the Holy Spirit will give you revelation to what is truth and what is not truth. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. He's the one that that teaches us the Word of God, and he's also the one that brings it to remembrance that we, we remember when we need it, you know? So when you have a moment like this and you're talking to somebody about Jesus and all of a sudden a scripture hits you, you're like, I know where that is. And I, it's not that I know where that is because look at me, I know where that is. It's I know where that is because the Holy Spirit is revealing it to me. See, that's what being spirit-filled is all about. And when you walk in that, and, and church, listen, you, th- there's such a joy in that. There's a, there's a confidence that rises up within you when you begin to, be able to call things that be not as though they are. When, 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 when you really understand when it says in Philippians that I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me, and what does that mean? And, and, and how do I apply that? And how do I use that in this situation? Peter and John are on their way to prayer like they do every day at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. They've seen this guy sitting there forever I'm sure they've passed by him over and over and over again. And all of a sudden, in the moment, something changed. There was something different that caused them to stop and to speak to this man that was lame. So here's what I want to do. I want to I I look at some things that comes out of this text that's talked about now in Acts chapter 4. Because what ends up happening, Peter and John, they do their their dissertation, if you will, to all those that were there, and then the religious leaders show up, and and they they squelch it. They they shut it down. The Scripture says that that, uh, Annas and John and Alexandra and Caiaphas and and the house of the, the, the religious leadership, all of them gathered, and they come to Peter and John and they, they begin to speak to them, and they begin to say, hey, you can't do this, and, and they're telling them all these things, and it's late in the day, so you know what they do? They arrest them, and they throw them in jail. 
And then the next day comes, and they pull them out of jail, and they bring them before the religious leaders. And the religious leaders begin to question them. And this is what I want to look at us today. I want to look at six things this morning that, that I think are for anyone that would say today, I am a born-again believer, and I am spirit-filled, and that I would see in my life through this story every single day that I could have an opportunity to show some kindness to somebody, but oftentimes we miss it because we walk by the opportunity, but that I would see the opportunity in showing kindness to somebody, and that because of that, a miracle happens. See, kindness is good. People like getting a text message, hey, thinking about you today, a card in the mail. We have a card ministry. Deb Edwards sends out cards all the time. Hey, Bridge South Bay loves you. Hey, we heard you're sick. Hey, how can we pray for you? We like those things. Those are good things. Acts of kindness. Saying hi to somebody. You know what? Just saying hi to somebody can make a difference in their life. I love it. I love walking down the street. Kathy's really good at this, but I, I love walking down the street and you see somebody and they're walking and you know they have no intention of acknowledging you whatsoever. <laughs> see, you're laughing, but I think that maybe that's some of you in this room that you have no intention of actually saying hi. And, and sometimes, you, you know, you're walking and, and you see somebody and, and I'll do this, you know, you walk around and all of a sudden I'll go, hey, Good morning. Try it. it is, it's amazing when you do that. It scares people, and then they don't know what to do, you know, and, and they're off, you know, themselves. And it's just a great thing to do, to say hi to people. Hey, good morning. Hi, how are you? Those kinds of things. And so I want to encourage you in that, because God will use those moments, those moments to extend kindness to somebody, and you never know that a miracle just might come out of it. You can change somebody's life by doing it. And that's what's happening in this story, is Peter and John have come to this place, and now they're being questioned by the religious leaders. And so I see six things that jump out. I'm going to walk through them really quick. The first is this. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 4.8, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, I love this idea because here they're, the two of them are standing. They're, they're standing in front of the, the elite, the people that know everything, the, the religious people, and, and it qualifies it. Here they are standing, and, and the Holy Spirit makes sure that when Luke, who is writing the book of Acts, writes in there, make sure they know that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? I'm not talking about being born again. Have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit that happened at the day of Pentecost? And in that upper room, 120 people hanging out, waiting for the promise that Jesus said, wait, the Father's going to send something. And, and they waited and waited for a few weeks. And then on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the crucifixion of Christ, after the resurrection of Christ, it says that the Holy Spirit showed up in that upper room and, and they described it like tongues of fire. And it just I think of a, of a campfire and I think of the flames going back and forth, back and forth. And it says that the Holy Spirit came into that upper room, and it was like tongues of fire, and it touched, it, it came upon each person in that room. And, and the, the Spirit came upon them, they were empowered, and the, the church in a lot of ways was launched in that moment. It says that Peter and John, filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak to these religious people. What does that look like to be filled with the Holy Spirit? What happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, the first time we saw somebody filled with the Holy Spirit was in the book of Exodus, going way, way, way back to almost the beginning of the Bible. And it says in chapter 35, verse 31, it says, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills. This was the artisan that was actually going to be making the, the temple. And it says that the Holy Spirit came upon him and when he came upon him, it gave him wisdom, it gave him understanding, it gave him knowledge, and it gave him all different kinds of skills. That was Peter and John in this moment. The Spirit of God was upon them. They had wisdom. 
They had knowledge. They had spiritual discernment. They were able to do something they couldn't do in the natural realm, but they were able to do it in the spiritual realm because the Holy Spirit was upon them. Church, here's, here's something that I want to encourage you in. Don't live your life without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't go through each day where you could have spiritual wisdom and spiritual discernment and spiritual knowledge and spiritual gifts that it talks about in 1 Corinthians 12. Gift of faith, gift of discernment, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, gift of healing, discerning of spirits. All of those things come through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It's for you, for today. Because the last time I checked, Jesus Christ was the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's what we have. And so be encouraged by that. Don't go through life as a, as a beaten dog like you, like you just can't do anything. Go through life as a new creation, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, living to the fullness of what God has given you because Jesus said, I've come to give you life and I've come to give you to you what? In the, in the full. And so when we live up, that's attractive to people. People look at that guy or that gal and they see him living up there. What? They got something. And whatever that something is, I want that something. You know, they, the, the glass is always half full. It's never half empty. And a spirit-filled believer, they, they always are, are keeping their eyes on the things above, not on the things of the world. They're, they're looking to heavenly things. They, they know that their time is short here, that they're just sojourners. We're just passing through the land because my home isn't really here. My home is in the presence of God. And I mean, you can start talking about the size of your house right now because it says there's mansions. And I'm pretty sure my mansion's going to be a little bit bigger than your mansion, so I, I'm not sure. So the Spirit is pulled out. We see this in Acts 1. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That's what Peter and John had. They were in that upper room. And that's why they had the ability to speak to this situation with this lame man. They were able to look past the physical ailment that this man had had for over 40 years and in faith being led by the Holy Spirit having discernment wisdom and knowledge they were able to call something that be not as though it was hey I don't have any money for you but what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ be healed oh by the way let me help you up miracle of kindness they stopped they took a moment they were spirit filled secondly these two guys acted in kindness. Acts 4, 8, look at this. Rulers and elders of the people. So here they are talking to him, and they address him. Rulers and elders of the people. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this. You are all a people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. They didn't, they didn't take the, the, the compliments. They didn't say it was us. Everything was pointing to Jesus. This is what Jesus did. And it was an act of kindness that they are being criticized for. You ever do something nice for somebody and then you get a critical spirit back or somebody criticizes you for something that you've done it, to go on your way to, to help somebody and to extend an act of kindness and it's not received that way? I think it's interesting that they're standing there talking to these religious people and, and, and they're like, you're reprimanding us for doing an act of kindness? Do you, do you see how silly that is? Do you, do you hear what's coming out of your mouth? The fact that this man is healed and is able to walk and hasn't been able to walk since birth, and now he is, and you're attacking us for something that God did? I mean, they had to feel foolish. I mean, that night when they climbed into bed, they must have thought, God, I'm an idiot. Let's not be idiots. Let's rise above and let's be those that see a need and, and, and reach out in kindness because you might see a miracle. Thirdly, we see that they were courageous. It takes courage to do that. Verse 13 says, when they saw the courage Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. This is, I love this part because sometimes we say, I can't do that because I don't know enough. 
I, I, can't, I can't talk about the Bible or I can't lead somebody to the Lord because I just don't know enough. And here these guys were ordinary, unschooled men, fishermen. And, and God has gotten a hold of them and they have given themselves over to the things of the Lord and they're pursuing everything after the Lord. And here they are, these ordinary, unschooled men and it says that the leaders saw courage in them. What do people see in you? They see courage? Or maybe, maybe not. Hebrews 10 says that we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but those who rise up to the persevering of the soul. See, as a Christian, we we should be able to say, because I know who I am and what I am in Christ, and because I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit, that I can walk in courage and in confidence. Not in cockiness, not in look at me, but because I have surrendered under the things of Him, that in my humility is where my strength is. I taught my kids that when they were growing up. I would say to them often, I said, you can be anything you want to be and you can do anything you want to do, but whoever you are and whatever you do, make sure you do it to glorify the kingdom of God because your greatest power is going to be in your humility. Your greatest strength in life is going to come out of your brokenness, surrendering to the things of God, and living in courage, not because of what you have done, but because of what God has done inside of you. And when you start living that way, it's you get pretty excited about getting up the next morning because you start believing that God is going to do something in your life. And this may be a prayer point. I just sense this. This may be a prayer point for some of you this morning. You may be saying, that's not me. I struggle with that kind of courage. I struggle with that, that kind of boldness. And that may be the thing this morning the Holy Spirit would speak to you individually about to say, don't leave here today without having some of that boldness. It may just be asking the Lord to pour His Spirit upon you and getting baptized in the Holy Spirit this morning. You can come down and pray with somebody to do that. As long as you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But if you're struggling with confidence, if you're struggling with an, a, a knowing of who you are in Christ and, and it causes you, to, when you have opportunities to, to show the miracle of kindness and you pull back, that's a prayer point. That's a place where you say, Jesus, I need to have you come into this part of my life because for whatever reason, I'm struggling with this thing, and I, I just pull away. I'm doing a uh, premarital counseling um, time with a couple. Um, and I've known the guy uh, since he was born. In fact, I was at the hospital the day he was born, and, and in about six weeks, five weeks, I'm going to be able to perform his marriage to his, his fiance. And... Um, I asked him this question this weekend when I was meeting with him. I said, um, do you want God to be a part of your marriage? Now, yeah, yeah, we want God to be a part of it. That's a really good thing. I'm glad, that's, I'm glad you said that. I go, so let me share with you what that looks like. And I started walking through the things that should be a part of a married couple's life who are Christians and want the Lord into it. So I started saying things like this. Do you ever pray together? No. Do you ever spend time together in the Word together? It's funny because as I say this, I'm reminded this, this message came out of my Devo time. And uh, this was like five or six days ago. And when Kathy came downstairs uh, I was getting ready to walk out the door, and I said, hey, would you do me a favor? If you have some time today, will you go and read Acts chapter 4? I just want you to read it. She's like, okay. And so later on that day, she looks at me. She goes, so I, I read it. What are, you, what are you looking for? I just, I just want to know, what jumped out at you? What were some of the things that you saw? That, you know, and she shared a couple of things. And I, I, go, I go, yeah, that's what I saw too. And I go, I go, I feel like the Lord wants me to preach a message on this on Sunday. See, this is the great thing about what married, marriage can be for believers. There really is ironing, sharpening iron. And when we come together like that, when we pray together, when we spend some time in the Word together, it doesn't, yeah, I, I, I'd love to stand up here and say, we do that every day together. No, we don't do that every day together, all right? Um, 
I, I mean, I, I'm lucky if I get a kiss, all right? So I'm just saying, no, I, I, just fun and come on. But, but here's the thing. That courage that comes when we've been with Jesus, when we do these things, and that's the, the fourth thing here, that, that the, the leaders saw that they had been with Jesus. Verse 13 says they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Have you been with Jesus? Are you getting filled up with the things of Him? Are you trusting in Him, putting your faith in Him, waiting on Him? It's worth the wait because God wants to do something supernatural in your life. Verse uh, number five, when you've been with Jesus, people don't know what to do. I love that. I think this is so fun. I've had this moment often. You know, I'll be hanging out with people and they know. They're like, cow. I know this guy's a pastor, but every time I ask a question, he just has an answer. You know, I'm not sure what to do with that. You know. So the leaders didn't know what to do with these guys because they're addressing them in front of all the people that saw this guy healed. And it scared them. Because if we throw them in jail, they're going to attack us because he did an act of kindness. They saw the miracle. They saw everything about it. And and so they didn't know how to respond to them. And in verse 16 of Acts 4, it says, what are we going to do with these men? I don't know. Why don't you set up a prayer line and have them start praying for people? That that may be a good start, right? Let's let's put them to work. Evidently, God's working through them. Let's utilize that. Let's let's put them to use type of thing. And that may be a word for some of you because God works through a lot of you in this room. Are you using the gifts that God has given you? Are you making yourself available to use those spiritual gifts that God has placed upon you and within you? Are you using those things That's an act of kindness to others. God gave them to you for a reason, and they're not for you to hold on to. They're not for you to covet. They're for you to use. What are we going to do with these men? How are we going to handle this situation? And then lastly, number six, worship team, you can come up. When you have been with Jesus... You can't stop talking about it. When you truly have hung out with Jesus, experienced Jesus' presence, learning from his word, walking in the gifts of the Spirit and the fullness of him, when you start knowing things, when you're with Jesus, you start knowing things. And how many know when you know something, what do you want to do? You want to share it. This is a true story. This is when I knew I was, I was being called into ministry. I was a young business owner, a uh, screen printing company. We printed lots of T-shirts. And, um, and I had, I don't know, 20 or 30 people working for me. And we were printing over a million shirts a year, a lot of shirts. And... I was on fire for the things of God. I was learning. I was growing. I'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've seen things that I'd never seen before in Scripture. I was plugged into church. I was plugged into a, a group of guys that I, that I walked with in accountability. We got together every week. And, and we just iron sharpening iron. And we'd, we'd confess sin. We'd cry together. We'd laugh together. I had a couple guys that you know, I'd get together with and a couple times they were at our house drinking coffee just in the word and, and they didn't leave my house until when the sun was coming up. The guy was just moving and doing massive things, great things. <laughs> um, I started knowing things. I started seeing things and I started seeing God work in my life and 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 then I just found myself, I, I just started talking to people about Jesus. And before I knew it, I'm like walking out into the production area and, and uh, I was like walking up to people, hey, how you doing? You know, good. 
hey, do you know Jesus? And before I knew it, I, I found myself like spending a lot of time during the day thinking, talking about Jesus with others. I led the guy, my consumer, uh, uh, the real estate agent for, for the building that I, that I leased. Um, I shared the story, but I led him to the Lord. I left my Bible on my desk. And people would come in, you know, people that, you know, maybe it was someone I was doing a sales call on, and they would see my Bible there. And oftentimes it would create conversation. This is why I, I still use this as opposed to this. This isn't bad. It's just something that draws attention to this. And for me, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Here's the thing I used to be. As a young Christian man, I was ashamed of the gospel. I didn't want to tell anybody about it. I remember getting asked one time, are you a born-again Christian? I said, no, I've always been one. That was ignorance. You see, when you know Jesus, when you really know Jesus, when you hang out with Jesus, when you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, you're going to want people to know. You're going to share. And when you begin to know things, here's the thing, God will start bringing people to you. You, you really don't need to stand on the corner with a sign yelling at people. You, you don't. I'm, I'm just telling you. God will bring people to you. He'll bring family members. He'll bring friends. He'll bring people in the neighborhood, people at your office. He will bring people. When you know Jesus, God is going to give you opportunity to share him. The question is, will you? Verse 18 of Acts 4, Then they called them again, in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. This is where I would stop right here. And I get a picture of, of Peter and John standing there. And, and now that they come in, they say, you're not going to speak in the name of Jesus. You're not going to do it anymore. And I'm pretty sure in that moment, Peter and John looked at each other and go, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We can't do it. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 32. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Your greatest fear in life should be standing before the kingdom of God, standing before the throne of Jesus Christ and the words that come out of his mouth say, I, I never knew you. So my question this morning as we come to an end, do you know Jesus? Do you truly know him? I'm not talking about just knowing about him. Okay. Scripture says that even Satan believes in Jesus. The question is, do you, do you know him in a relationship? And if you don't, you can know him before you leave here today. You can, right in your pew, you can invite Jesus into your life. Say, Lord, I confess my sins to you. I believe you're the Son of God and you died on the cross for me and I want you to be my Lord and Savior. You can pray that prayer. As long as you pray it from the heart. As long as you pray it from within. Or you can come down and pray with one of the prayer people. They would love to pray with you. Maybe you're here today and you're like, man, I, I don't have that kind of courage. I don't have that kind of wherewithal right now. You've never experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can have that happen today too before you leave here. You can ask God just to pour His Spirit upon you, just a posture of receiving, and He'll come. And one of the things that may come out of that is you may start having a prayer language. It talks about it in Acts. It talks about it in Corinthians. And so all of these things can happen right now. The question is, do you want it? So Jesus said this, ask and you'll receive. Knock and the door will be open. Lord, are you there? Yep, I'm right here. James 4, come to me, says the Lord, 
and I will come to you. Draw near to me, says the Lord, and I will draw near to you. Ask, you will receive. Knock, and the door will be opened. Seek, and you'll find. Jeremiah 29, 13. You will find me, says the Lord, when you seek me with all of your heart. You know when you want to go get a certain kind of food? You just got a hankering for something. You're just craving something. What do you do? You start seeking. What restaurant is that food at? Where are we going to go and get it? Should we go to the grocery store, buy it, bring it home and make it? You start thinking about it. You start processing it. Do that with Jesus. Seek Him. Amen? Father, I'm so thankful for this church. I'm so thankful for this group of people. Lord, I love them. And Lord, we love you together. We love all of you. We love the Father. We love the Son. And we love the Holy Spirit, Lord God. Today I pray as we close in this last worship song that you would just do what you do, Lord God. Would you just touch people right now where they're at? Lord, just speak to them. Lord, whatever it may be, Lord God, that they would, they would ask. They would knock. They would believe. They would trust, Lord God. And so, Lord, just pour your spirit upon this place. Fill this room, Lord God, as you already have. And that, Lord, we may just have a touch of you right before we leave this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Let's stand as we have one more last worship.